Hi, Misha here, and now we get to the MiG-23 Flogger. This was kind of the opposite counterpart to the MiG-25 Foxbat. The MiG-25 was a bomber interceptor, a reconnaissance plane, and had limiting bombing capability. Well, the MiG-23, even though the name would suggest it came out first, actually came out a couple of years after the 25, and this was a tactical fighter and fighter bomber. And originally, it was hoped that this would replace the MiG-21. Well, it didn't quite work out that way, but it was produced. They would build just under 5,050 of these in the Soviet Union. And they would get some users outside of the Russian VVS, Russian Air Forces. Although it would not achieve near the success of the MiG-21. However, it was quite a high performance aircraft and it was the first Russian variable sweep wing aircraft and actually the most produced variable sweep wing aircraft in history. So with that, yeah, we'll just revisit it, talk about some different models and versions. Here, I do have one new one that you haven't seen in a video before. We have the 23MS, our nice bright red one is a 23MF. Then above it, we have a 23ML, and then finally we have the 23MLD. These are the ones that Hobby Master makes in 172 scale. I really wish they would do a MiG-27 or even a MiG-23B or BM, but you know, maybe they will eventually. With that, let's go back to 1960s Russia the vacation spot of the galaxy. The MiG-25 Foxbat was very high altitude, very high speed, very impressive aircraft, but it was a dedicated interceptor and reconnaissance aircraft. It also required quite a long and well-equipped runway to operate from. It was quite thirsty on the fuel it had no guns, it just had four, later six, air-to-air -air missiles. Yeah, you, you know, you can check out that video. And originally the MiG-23 name was used for the competition to the uh, MiG-21. The MiG-21 was the Delta wing. The MiG-23 prototype or design concept was uh, swept wing. That's why they jumped to MiG-25. But in the early 60s, the MiG Design Bureau was kind of looking at the replacement for the MiG-21, a light tactical fighter. And in 1963, the Russian government, the VVS, issued specifications. It wanted an aircraft that could primarily use air-to-air -air missiles, beyond visual range, have an advanced radar as standard. Remember the MiG-21 originally at least did not have a radar as standard. And it needed to be able to operate from the front lines, meaning short takeoff and landing or even maybe vertical takeoff or landing. Basically operating from rough airstrips, maybe unprepared. And yeah, one thing they didn't really care too much about was maneuverability. Speed, weapons, payload, those were more important. So in 1965, MiG would set up two different design teams. One would work on a vertical takeoff and landing model, known as the MiG-23-01. And the other would work on a variable wing geometry, or swing wing design, known as the MiG-23. 
2311. Obviously, that's what won out. The 2301, while it was shown off, it was basically a dead end. The, the, the vertical lift surfaces, while it would allow the aircraft to operate from a short field, weren't really that useful. The first prototype of it would fly in April of 1967, and then the first swing wing prototype would fly that summer. So, a little behind. But it was this, the swing wing design, that definitely won. And in December of 1967, it was ordered into production as just the MiG-23. And they would uh, gear up, and it would go into production. In 1970. At least that was the plan. <laughs> the original MiG 23S had a lot of issues. It was in no way, shape, or form fully combat capable. So they would go back and make some redesigns. They would go to a 20% larger wing. They would rework the radar. And they would come up with what was either just known as the MiG 23 plain and simple, or the MiG-23-1971 for the year it was released in. And this was an improvement, yet it still suffered from reliability problems to do with the engine and radar, and maintenance durability, and pilots did not necessarily like how it handled. So it would not actually be until the third version, the MiG-23M, that we finally had a winner in 1972. By the way, NATO would designate the original 23S as the Flogger A, and with the 23M, we would go to the Flogger B. And that's where our models come in here. The idea behind this aircraft, it used SFR radar, actually quite similar to that used in the later MiG-25 PD. It was look down, shoot down capable, although the initial versions were limited. Later ones would be more advanced. And the same thing kind of goes for its armament. Originally these would use the older R3 missile, but they were working on a new generation of medium range missiles for this, known as the R23. And they just were producing a new generation of lightweight short missiles known as the R-60. Very good missiles, actually. So it had a new weapon suite. It had a dual-barrel 23mm cannon with about 250-260 rounds. Initially, it did not carry an underbelly fuel tank, but by the time of the 23M, it would allow for one. It had a total of six hard points, two under the gloves, two under the fuselage, two up front. Originally, it had an improved ejection seat. While it was zero altitude capable, the aircraft still needed to be going about 80 miles per hour for safe ejection. We had this massive single engine after burning. We had a new heads-up display that they would initially use in these and improve. And of course, we had the wing itself fully swept back, as you see it here. This would be for high-altitude performance or kind of dashing, as they called it, to low levels. These were manually set in the kind of... Uh, medium 45 degree angle. This was for just routine performance cruising. And fully forward with minimal sweep. This was for low altitude bombing and takeoff and landing from short airfields because that was one benefit unlike the mig-25 this didn't need a lot of runway especially considering its power and speed 
and because of its undercarriage arrangement, it could it could take a bit of a beating when hitting the ground. It was a durable aircraft for all that it kind of started off rocky. Lengthwise, we're about 55 feet, and with the wings fully deployed like this, we're just under 46 feet wide. But again, if we sweep them back all the way, we cut that down to about 25 feet. So quite compact. Maximum speed was about Mach 2.3 at altitude and a bit under Mach 1.2 near sea level. So not as fast as the MiG-25 but still very comparable to say the F-14 and uh, its maximum altitude was about 60,000 feet so nothing to sneeze at there. And it could lift over 6,000 pounds in payload on top of all that. So, yeah, not too shabby, all things considered. Now this is actually called the Flogger E, the MiG-23 MS. This was a downrated version for export to foreign nations, typically the Middle East, some in Northern Africa. It did not have the full look down, shoot down, beyond visual range capable Sapphire radar. It had the older radar from the 23S. Therefore, it only really could use the R3 or R60 missiles. Still had the gun though. It also had more basic navigation and countermeasures systems. It was just a stripped down version. That's why this model has uh, four of the R3 missiles underneath it, plus, of course, a tank. This one is from uh, the uh, Middle East. And these were used some in various conflicts, but they were only produced from 1973 to 1978 because. Yeah, the, the Middle East, no one really was that happy with it. Russia just was trying to keep its advanced technology for itself and its close allies. But this model is quite neat for, um, for what you get because it's one of the few in the series that has the original single attachment point. Pylons up front and then the rear glove pylons. They have more of those. And what I really like about the way Hobby Master has done these, you can have the tank and have it on the stand. They give you two tanks. One of them just has a hollow notch cut in it for the stand to peg through. Not only do the wings sweep and you can have gear up or down, you can also have the lower tail fin folded down for its in-flight position. When I did the video earlier, people pointed out that I forgot to plug this in, so my bad. <laughs> this is in the flight style. Again, the 23MS would actually see quite a bit of combat use in the 70s. And the West would really get their first up-close look. Egypt would acquire a relatively small number of these in 1973-74, but that was when they were having their falling out with the Warsaw Pact. So they were more than happy to share the planes with both China and the USA, you know, in exchange for other considerations. So the U.S. got their hands on these quite quickly. So with that, let's talk about some other versions. Here we have the MiG-23 MF Flogger B. This was essentially the exact same as the VVS's 23M, including having the look down, shoot down radar. 
Originally, the MF was for Warsaw Pact nations, so about the only differences were the friend and foe transponders, communication gear, what have you. This colorful example is from the Czech Air Force, and I have it in the ground configuration. Kind of has this upswept gear with little mud guards. You can also see the folding rear fin here for ground clearance. And this would be the one, like the Russian version, that would use the uh, R-23 missile as well as, in the beginning, two R-60s, but soon they'd introduce a double pylon for a total of four R-60s. So two medium range and four short range, plus the guns. And these could carry actually up to four fuel tanks, although usually just one was standard. And um, yeah, this would uh, go into service. Eventually, the 23MS would be replaced by a different 23MF with kind of a slightly downgraded radar that still had beyond visual range capability. That was around 1978 though. But uh, the 23MF was the primary tactical fighter version. They also had the 23B, a bomber version, which led to the 23BM which eventually led to the 27, also known as the Flogger D. Very similar, different nose, different, a little bit slightly elevated cockpit. It had a laser rangefinder for designated ground targets. And the 23 and the 27 here, they could carry unguided iron bombs or rocket pods. So they, they always had ground attack, fighter bomber as a secondary role, but it, um, you know, wasn't the full Monty. For that, they had the Suhoi SU-25, the Frogfoot. And normally I don't go for crazy color schemes like this, uh, this one here called the Hellfighter, but I got a good deal on it, so, meh. Why not? I didn't have a 23MF. Notice the fin here. Also note the uh, spine in front of the tail. Sweep our wings in. So that was just the first generation. The second they'd start working on and the first prototype would fly in 1976 and in 1978 this version would go into production and service. Meet the MiG-23 ML with L standing for lightweight also known as Flogger G. And this was MiG putting the Flogger on a diet. And they were able to shave off over 2,700 pounds while improving things. This would go to an uprated engine with a more effective afterburner. They would uh, rework the airframe a bit. They wanted to save some weight. They also strengthened the uh, swing wing mechanism, the gearbox because they were having maintenance issues and cracking. They continued to improve the radar. This model here, which is the new one, does have the uh, R-60 missiles, but there's only the kind of early two style. And it has the well, actually, I'm not sure if these are R23 or the improved R24. I suppose it doesn't really matter. Later, MLs are known as MLAs, and with those, they would continue to introduce 
new uh, things, including the R-24 missiles. Eventually, the Flogger would even be equipped with the R-73 Apex, and well, excuse me, uh, Apex and the Aphid, but which would become quite famous in the MiG-29. So they're improving both its short and medium range missiles as well as trying to address some of that maneuverability. It was a decent dogfighter, but because the VVS didn't care much about dogfighting and maneuverability in the beginning, by the 70s and after the lessons of Vietnam, they really did what they could to make it so. And they did a quite decent job. VVS pilots felt that the uh, 23 ML was superior to the West's F-4 Phantom. Kind of feeling like it was equal to the F-16, at least the original F-16As and Bs. But yeah, these went into production in 1978. And that would continue for several years. There would also be a derivative for the PVO, known as the 23P, which had an improved and more customized air defense radar and ground link control interfaces and, you know, the typical stuff you expect for the um, uh, PV, PVO. But, of course, the MiG-25 was also used by them. But they would get about 560 between the late 70s and early 80s. This model here, kind of interesting. It's from Poland. Like I said, it does have the proper missiles. Note that it doesn't have that spine back here. And there's a few other minor differences in detailing. And of course, quite a few internal changes too, like the uprated engines. And uh, this was a very popular version, but there still weren't a ton of foreign users. The MiG-21 was very popular. It was inexpensive, it was easy to work on, easy to maintain. The MiG-23 cost more, and it was more difficult. It always had a higher accident rate. I mean, when you have moving wings and a much more advanced radar. It's bound to happen, not to mention a very powerful engine. Some customers would buy it. Uh, many were sent to Iraq when they used them in the 1980s against Iran, but they were often outclassed by the F-14. They were also used by Syria and Libya like I said earlier, Egypt flew the MiG-23 briefly. Then actually it went back to the MiG-21, and the Libyan MiGs were sent up against it. <laughs> kind of interesting. In fact, a uh, an Egyptian MiG-21 actually shot down a Syri uh, excuse me, a Libyan MiG-23 during the conflict between those two nations. This never really made its way over to Asia, like China and what have you. Again, it was just... I, I think part of it was that the, the MiG-21 was so popular, so customizable, so upgradable. This was a very advanced and capable fighter, but a lot of users just weren't uh, sold on it. Even in Russia, while the PVO seemed to like it just fine, it had a bit of a mixed reputation in the VVS. But there was the final version we can talk about here. The MiG-23 MLD with D standing for upgrade again. This was the version that Russia mostly used in Afghanistan in the 1980s. These were used as fighters. They actually went up against Pakistani flown F-16s and they were used as fighter bombers against Afghan forces quite a bit. And they did really quite well. None were lost in air-to-air -air combat. 
five were lost to accidents, failures, and five were lost to ground fire, things like Stinger missiles. But this really is considered to be the ultimate fighter version. At this point, they can have R-60 or R-73 missiles, or R-23 or R-24s are becoming more common. The countermeasures have been improved. Radar warning systems have been improved. They continued to improve the uh, Sapphire radar in these. They finally have really achieved decent reliability with both the engine and swept wing design. They continued to tinker with the wing a bit, altering the edges from time to time. And they made more changes to the uh, airframe to improve maneuverability and just overall handling. Notice it has these couple of strikes on top here are fences. Not wing fences, but fences, I guess you could say. And there's a few other small differences in the nose for this uh, model here. This one has the double pylons for the uh, R60s, which is pretty neat. But uh, this one came out from Hobby Master about a year or two ago. And they've done another MLD. And actually the ML we looked at I think is their most recent release in this series. But yeah, these saw quite a bit of use in Afghanistan. Now the ones used by the VVS were actually upgraded MLs. I think they upgraded about 500. And MIG would produce wholly new airframes in the MLD for export. But even though initially they considered continuing to develop the design going to a next generation like a biz like they did with the MIG-21. Because of continuing issues and frankly just not a huge amount of success outside of Russia and even not just a major hit within Russia. The MiG-23 design was kind of quietly suspended in the yeah, time period of 1983. And the last new production machines rolled off the assembly line at the very end of 1984. It's worth pointing out that the MiG-25 also had its final production run earlier that year. So both the 23 and the 25 would have production ending in 1984. But of course, this is also right around the same time the MiG-29 is finally getting into full production and going into widespread service. And while the uh, 23 is a very neat aircraft, yeah, most people would agree the 29 is better. But um, like I said, Iraq would continue to fly these. In fact, they would fly them during the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, the Saddam's forces would use the 23B variant, the, the fighter-bomber variant, to suppress uh, Kuwaiti defenses. And they would fly these as actual pure fighters, as the 23MF or ML in 1991. And uh, several would be lost in that war one way or another. According to Iraqi records, 43 were destroyed, either in the air or on the ground. Another 10 ha had major damage, and 15 up and fled to Iran. <laughs> so that was a good chunk of, uh, from the Iraqi Air Force and their Flogger fleet. But they would continue to fly them through the 1990s and into the early 2000s. But during the invasion in 2003... Much as had been done with the MiG-25, the MiG-23s in Iraq were grounded. But these would pop up from time to time. Now in Russia, in 1991, as the Soviet Union fell and became the Russian Federation, there were about 1,500 in all variations in the PVO and VVS service. Now they would continue using them. But they would finally retire them in 1998 after around a 
post-Cold War budget cuts. And this would be right in line with uh, other Warsaw Pact, or I should say former Warsaw Pact nations. Czechoslovakia would uh, break apart, and the Czech Republic would inherit the uh, Flogger fleet. They would first retire the older 23 MFs in 1994, and then they would retire their ML fleet in 1999. And much the same thing happened in Poland. So as we move into the 21st century, very few are flying, very limited use. Russia, well I should say the, the MiG company, did offer an upgrade program, the MiG-2398, but it was dropped because there really were no takers. It is worth pointing out though that while no one really cared to upgrade their 23s, there were plenty of countries, including India, that were happy to upgrade their 21s. In the end, the MiG-21 outlasted both the 23 and the 25. So, hmm. There we have it, folks. It's really a neat fighter, though. In a lot of ways, it is like the Russian F-14. When we think of swing-wing military aircraft, I'd say the F-14 Tomcat certainly comes to mind. But, truth is, many, many more MiG-23s were produced. And even though fewer nations use these compared with the earlier MiGs, only two nations ever flew the F-14. And the F-111 Art of Art, another swing-wing design, wasn't much more successful itself. And this is really a neat design. It was designed for two main purposes, and it did those competently well. And it was a lot cheaper to purchase than, say, an F-16 or F-15. But technology caught up with it. This is considered a third generation aircraft, but the fourth generation MiG-29 would, uh, would replace it. But for about 15 years, it was a very common, very popular fighter in Russia. And uh, it's really good that Hobbymaster does this one. Even though I'd love to see a 27 or a 20 23B. They also did a 23U and UB, which is a two seat trainer known as Flogger C. I'd love to see more variations, but I'm at least happy they have kind of moved into the ML, MLDs before they were just doing the MFs and the MSs. So, yeah, without Hobbymaster, we wouldn't have any of these. And they did a really good job with this uh, model. The, uh, the wings, because of how thin they are, are plastic, but they are geared together. The body here is all metal. Our vertical is plastic, again, because it's thin, but our horizontals are uh, metal. It's relatively light, but it's also a relatively light aircraft in general. We have a big intake here. One thing to note, this was, along with the 25, the first MiG design to go to the side intakes, leaving the nose free for equipment like the radar with the MiG-15, MiG-17, MiG-19, and MiG-21. It was always a compromise, and you always had limited space for your radar system. But not here. <clears throat> and it really did have quite good short takeoff and landing performance. Not, you know, vertical takeoff and landing. Nothing like a Harrier. But then again, we don't have wasted equipment or a specialized engine like the Pegasus. And this was very much a Mach 2 Plus 
and very high altitude aircraft and with a payload of over 6,000 not uh, too bad either I believe later versions actually had a zero zero ejection seat but I may be misremembering that I can't remember for sure but they did tinker with it and improve it throughout its uh, life expectancy yeah like I said this is my newest one it does have the double pylon it just came with uh, one missile each though which I kind of like it's an earlier take on it like I said I believe this one is from the Polish Air Force in the uh, 1990s and it's something at least new to show you plus I had to do them with the uh, fins installed because I forgot last time as I said <laughs> they just plug in so not a big deal and there we have it guys the frankly sometimes forgotten but still very cool MiG 23 vlogger let me know what you think and I appreciate you just uh, hanging out with me this is Misha and I'll catch you very soon next time